Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the November 14th, 2022 meeting of the Whatcom County Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force. My name is Stephen Gockley. I'm the co-chair. Uh, my fellow co-chair, Jack Hoganier, is on vacation today and won't be able to join us. Before we begin, we acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lummi, Nooksack, Samish, and Semiamu people who have cared for and tended this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We pay respect to their elders, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, and we're pleased to start off uh, with a presentation of our communications messaging work that we have uh, contracted with Pyramid Communications. And we have Emily Getz, Vice President uh, of Pyramid with us and with Temple Water Consulting. And we have Sakara Ramu here with us as well. And uh, if I may, I'll turn it over to Emily and Sakara for their presentation of the work that they have been developing for the task force and communicating with the community. That's great. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I believe we have met. There may be there may be a new face or two here, or a new name or two here. So I'm um, Emily Getz. I'm with Pyramid Communications. I use she her pronouns. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Sakara Ramu, who is serving as the project lead on this body of work with you all. So we're um, very glad to be here. I'm going to share my screen. I'll try to share the correct desktop. Can you see this PowerPoint? Great. OK, awesome. Um, so I'll, I'll just do a quick overview of what we're hoping to talk through today and then uh, turn it over to Sakara. Um, for our agenda today, and actually, I also want to um, just confirm we should be wrapping up uh, this portion of the conversation by like by 9.45, is that right? Jill, did you have a time uh, allocation? Uh, not exactly, but that sounds about right. We have another presenter coming on a little bit later as well. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll try to keep it um, tight and appreciate your everyone's time today. So what we are hoping to do is pick up on uh, the conversation that we've been having with you all to date around uh, narrative and messaging, speaking to the task force's work in Whatcom County. And um, we wanna come back to the some of the overarching framing options that have been developed for messaging. This is that like very highest line of sight, if you know, like headline version of what it is that the task force is here to do and accomplish in Whatcom County. Um, and then we wanna talk a little bit more about the Ann Deacon Center for Hope. Know that there has been conversation potentially about an event to celebrate the anniversary of the Center for Hope. Um, regardless of whether or not there, there is an event that takes place, um, we have also talked with you all about and continue to feel like um, the timing of the anniversary and this very tangible um, partnership-based effort that's taking place in the community offers a really nice way to start to talk about the task force's work. And so the idea is that you know we um, realize the opportunity of celebrating the Center for Hope as an initial point of entry into a broader, what becomes a broader conversation about the task force's work in the community. Um, and so to that end, um, we will need uh, to create some visual assets to be starting to create um, social media channels, um, assets for email outreach and tools that you all will need long term for more regular communication about the task force's work. So we have created some initial three options. Um, for visual brand development for the task force uh, and for the Center for Hope um, in the hopes that that is helpful um, as something that we have not understood exists today. Um, 
So of course, if we if we got any of that wrong, happy to adapt our thinking there. But um, so create a couple of brand options for each that we would then use to develop graphics, materials, et cetera, to support communications. Um, Sakari, anything to add or adjust for our agenda today? Or any other questions from anyone else on the agenda? I think it's good. Awesome, okay. So let's start um, with a conversation about uh, narrative and messaging review. Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, as Emily said, for the time uh, with you today to give you an update on where we are uh, since last we met. Uh, Emily, can you just entertain me and just go to the beginning of the deck? Yes. I'm a little, I'm a little fuzzy this, this Monday Oops. morning. Back one more. Okay, I'm sorry. And then back to the the uh, third page. Okay, great. So um, as Emily said, we have final narrative and messaging review. And much of this you have seen before, but we've been adjusting, refining, uh, sharpening the primary messaging. And um, hopefully you had some time with this before the meeting. If not, there, there's still plenty of time if you need to provide um, feedback after the meeting. It's perfectly fine. But as you can see, we're basically just talking about the primary messaging for the need, the solution, the proof of concept, and the current state and focus of the work of the task force today. And then if you want to see the, you know, the, the broader finite messaging that we've been talking about, there's a link there for you to do so. Next slide. Huh, um, current state and focus today is blank. Yeah, it's strange, actually. I can see it on my view. Oh, there oh, it is. I don't know what happened. <laughs> huh. Odd. Okay. <laughs> Overarching framing. So uh, the last time we met with you all, we went through the need, the solution, proof of concept, and current state and focus today, and went through the full kind of uh, nuts and bolts of baseline messaging to make sure that we understand. Here, what you're seeing is just the key initiative primary messaging for each of those, the need, the solution, the proof of concept, the current state and focus today. Next slide. We're getting ready to move in, as Emily said, into message testing. Um, and so we're gonna talk about what some of the goals are for that, the testing for the overarching framing and IPR task force, and the testing for the Ann Deeker Center for Hope. We'll talk a little bit more about the asset creation, which Emily touched on a little bit. We have branding and, and some things to look at. And then capacity um, for such testing, event or no event. Next slide. Hmm. Huh. It's very strange. The content is showing up on my end, but not initially when I switched slides for you all. But there we go. I think you can see this now. Yeah. So as we've discussed before, the purpose of um, message testing and the goals that we're focused on is establishing uh, the IPRTF and its positioning in the work that's being done. Understanding who you are, why the work uh, exists, um, and what it is that you're doing. We need branding for the task force and the Ann Deeker Center for Hope, something that is clear, compelling branding for both the task force and the center um, that folks can see and recognize immediately what it is. Building an audience base, establishing channels to work and build uh, following for the IPRTF communications. And as Emily mentioned, 
this is our entry point. We're telling a timely story. This will be happening around the two year anniversary uh, of the Center for Hope. So a timely story of something that is tangible and visible in our community. And for us on the back end, we're establishing sustainable platforms and channels for communications going forward, which is a key part of our deliverables to you are, is to be able to um, kind of templatize this work going forward. And then identify audience pathways, identify the people, the organizations, the entities that are engaged with our target audiences, prioritize messengers for testing efforts and define a structure for collaboration across key messengers, which I promise will make sense in the coming weeks. <laughs> Emily, anything to add there? No, I, I don't think anything, um, nope, not there, thank you. Okay, great. And so with message testing, as you know, we've had a great deal of um, very helpful and vibrant discussion about what is the overarching frame, framing language that we are going to use for this effort. And you can see on that slide um, the many options that we've discussed since we've started this work with you all. And this is something that um, we would recommend we have message testing on. Um, which we have discussed with, I think, at least the, the um, steering committee leadership team before. And so we have those one, two, three, four options there. Very interested in you know, learning a, a bit more about how the layman um, understands and relates to those terms. Emily, anything to add? No, curious. Um... After our last conversation um, at last month's task force meeting, just any kind of further follow-up thoughts or questions on um, the set of options here, criminal justice, public safety, criminal legal, public health, criminal legal, behavioral health, criminal justice, public safety. Great, okay, awesome. Great. And so uh, we understand that you all are still deciding whether or not to have an actual physical event. Um, and obviously, the language of this suggests that you will. But even if you don't, to coincide with January 2023, um, we will utilize the Anne Deacon Center for Hope, that anniversary, as the lens and focal point for this initial message testing and building confidence in the IPRTF early through that demonstrated visible impact of the Center for Hope in community serving Whatcom County and the North Sound region. Um, yeah, next slide. So as I mentioned uh, before, and as we've shared with you all before, messaging and assets, the things that uh, we will be developing for the initial message testing, uh, aligned overarching branding for both the task force and the Center for Hope, some revised content on the task force web page, social content and graphics, email update and format content and list or lists, plural, posters for in community, toolkit for partners and key messenger activation, and an op-ed or two. Next slide. Emily, do you want to talk about um, the capacity for this event or no event? Sure. Um, so we um, just want to make sure that we're thinking with you all really proactively about how we can best support um, your capacity to implement this effort. So as we kind of take a step back and think about, OK, whether whether through an event or through just communicating about the anniversary, um, what um, do you, will Sakara and I need? Um, that hopefully we can begin to plan for now in terms of capacity and support. You know, kind of baseline is really about reviews and approvals. Um, we want to make sure that final messaging and the assets that we're creating feel really good and right on. 
um, we want to um, make sure that uh, we are able to talk through uh, county communications channels and, and city com communications channels as well um, and look for opportunities to, to partner and cross pollinate. We wanna make sure um, that there's capacity wherever it is uh, on whichever county city channels that will be engaged as part of this effort as messengers and sharing communications. We wanna make sure that there's capacity to implement there. And if not, um, you know, happy to talk about how we can support. Um, and then for paid social as well, we do in, imagine that part of the communications will include some paid social presence um, on the channels that we utilize. At the very least, we um, imagine at this point setting up social channels for the task force itself and doing some paid promotion there. If we were to determine together that it's helpful to do some support and paid promotion on other county or city channels and um, capacity to, to support and implement there. And again, this is kind of, you know, can be um, subsequent additional conversation with those teams um, and uh, the ability to establish some analytics monitoring mechanisms. So we want to make sure um, that we're able to understand the success of what we're doing. Arlene, I see a hand. Oh, I oh, think I you're think on mute. Did. Excuse me. Um, my question is about the term capacity. What are you really, are you talking about money or manpower? What, what does that mean? Great question. Thank you. Um, we're talking about um, staff and team time to partner with us. Staff and team time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. So since we're looking at an effort, Arlene, for example, in very early January, and we know folks go, you know, there's holidays, people are traveling, and we're talking about capacity when we need you all to review and approve things that will be published. So that would be something for capacity that we would want to make sure we have that lined up ahead of time. So if we have an op-ed, you know, and Stephen is in the Bahamas and he's one of the <laughs> people that is signing it, we have gotten his, <laughs> his approval on that document and folks on the task force have had time to review it, et cetera. So that's, that's really what we mean by team capacity is there, there becomes a whole cadence and a process for asset development, asset approval, and then asset publication. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, that's an important clarification. Okay, so I think that um, from there we are ready to share some visual branding options unless um, any questions to this point or Sakari, anything else that would be good to talk through before we go there? No, I think we're good. Cool. Okay. So we have developed three options for visual branding for the task force itself, um, as well as the Center for Hope. Um, and again, we're we're we've been operating under the assumption that there there's not existing branding for the Center for Hope. And so, if there is anything existing that we should have been aligning to um, more closely, definitely look forward to hearing that feedback from folks as well. Um, what I'm going to share are what we often refer to as mood boards. And so what they, they include some sample fonts, um, logo or word marks, uh, depending on how we think about that. Um, and what we'll do is kind of walk through the options. And then at this point, what we're looking for is like gut level feedback, love this, hate that, um, on colors, on fonts, on the, on the visuals that you see. And Stephen, I see a hand up too. Yeah, Emily, I just wanted to be clear on the process. So today you're looking for some interactive feedback from task force members. The process for using that feedback will be what in your mind? Meet, meeting again with the steering committee and the group you've been engaged with, or uh, how do you ex expect to proceed? Great question, thank you. So today um, we have these initial three options that we'll share. What we are hoping for is um, feedback that helps give us more direction about refinement and evolution. So what we would do is, yeah, interactive feedback today is great. Anything that strikes folks in terms of lights, hates, you know, middle of the road um, is great. And then what we would do is take that feedback back to our design team and share it with them. And they will develop another iteration of look and feel options based on what we've heard that works to get much closer than this starting point today. Okay. Um, so one thing that I'll share is that 
we are, um, because we want to move swiftly through this um, and uh, we're not necessarily moving through a full rebrand or deep brand establishment through this process, but this is really about starting to breathe some visual and verbal through messaging and visuals life into the task force and um, the Center for Hope, given that that's the first thing that we'll be communicating about. Uh, what we've what we've done is try to actually align fairly and um, try to establish some clear visual connections to the counties, to Whatcom County's visual brand, um, and not deviate too far. I think in our point of view, from our point of view, brand development is something that can continue to evolve over time. So there may be tweaks to task force branding or center for hope branding, or you know that occur in years to come. But right now, I think based on where we are, we're working to establish some clear direction and um, and some and, and some resonance with you know where all of this work is is initially originating from. So let's see. Okay. Um, so uh, what we'll do is look at an option for the task force and the center for hope that are somewhat related. So this is option one for task force visual branding. You'll see um, uh, Whatcom County's brand, of course, reflected in the upper right for reference and how we've ad adapted that to apply to the task force. So there are two options for word marks here. If the word mark um, and or you know, logo, we use those words intercha interchangeably, um, were used as, as a square or in a horizontal format, depending on where it shows up, letterhead versus social media, et cetera. Um, you'll see some colors being applied here, and you'll see um, some font recommendations that would be used in uh, written communications uh, and, in, and in visual designs when we're using content speaking to the task force. And I'll go through these a couple of times, so um, initial will be a little bit quicker and then we'll spend more time. Then we have... Um, option one for the Anne Deacon Center for Hope. Um, so what we're working to do here is establish a little bit more, a little bit broader of a color palette um, under our you know, kind of frame of reference for understanding the multiple partnerships in and where the Anne Deacon Center for Hope sits in the landscape to us says um, less of a need to align quite as closely to the county's brand. And so we're ex expanding the visual development beyond that a little bit more here and creating something that can stand a bit more on its own while still some clear overlap and, and relation. Um, so we have three logo options for the Center for Hope. And then below what you see is um, a color palette that would accompany this visual brand. And so we would use these colors um, to, to populate any kind of visual design we're doing. All right, so then option two for the Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force. Again, we have two word mark or kind of logo options at the top. Um, you'll see this option is leaning much more heavily into like keeping very, staying very simply focused on that um, kind of core blue tone and then some font options. And option two um, related to the Antiquan Center for Hope. Different color pat palette here, leaning more into still kind of carrying forward, in this case, the teal and the blue associated with Whatcom County, but expanding beyond into um, some blue and purple tones. And then finally, option three starting with the Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force logo word marks. And then we have fonts there. You'll see the teal, um, bringing the teal color more for, to be more forward in this option with the logo. And the related option for the Ann Beacon Center for Hope. Um, using shapes, the teal color here as well, and introducing the idea potentially of like, some shapes um, or colors and um, using the, uh, a circle to speak to kind of wraparound services experience, continuity of experience and support. Um, so I see, um, Raylene, I see your hand. I'm happy to pause here for kind of questions and then we can go back and take a slower look through the slides too. I just wanted to say, I liked option one and three for the incarceration task force portion. And then if you go back to, I believe it's 
option one for the Andy Deacon Center of Hope. Um, no, the one before that. Oh, yeah. I had a very interesting experience with our slide switching here today. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> I think it was, I thought it was option one for, yeah. Ah, we missed it. You missed it. There. it close. Got it. <laughs> um, I like number three. You know, everybody has their own opinions, but I kind of like the sun type thinking it's, it's a, like you're reborn new, new options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyways, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Raylene. Arlene, I see your hand. Yeah, um, I agree with Raylene. I think the uh, symbol is unique. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not seen that. It's similar to the others, but it's unique. And I, mm -hmm. I like that. I like the way that the symbol stands out and um, uh, the print underneath it just you know, visually, it looks really good. That's great. Um, right. It's hard to remember all the other ones. I made notes, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I wasn't sure exactly which ones they, they belong to, but I had a, an opinion on everything. <laughs> Should we, we, um, we can run through the slides here if that helps kind of spark. Okay. This one, this slide, um, Ever since the beginning of our uh, uh, having a, a task force, I had trouble remembering the the two words after incarceration for some <laughs> reason. And so for that reason, um, anything that uh, enables them to stand out, I guess I, I favor. So in this particular, these two, it looks to me like the, um, the horizontal, um helps you see uh the prevention and reduction part in a more i think a more it stands out more really appreciate that i um would just echo in any kind of um, organization or entity effort name where we have more than a few words i think that's what we really want a logo or word mark to do is to be helping our brain make um, yeah. easier associations of the point of the entity. Yeah, I feel like all of these things that we're talking about are extremely important because they either grab you or they don't. And okay. <laughs> you want it, you want them grabbed. Yeah, right. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. One, one opportunity to make a first impression. Yeah. And then uh, in this one, uh, current, this current one, the, the horizontal, seems stronger mm -hmm. for, for remembering the whole phrase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one, um, I'm not sure exactly why, but I think without the frame, it looks better to me visually. Um, it, it emphasizes the, uh, the attractive uh, font. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely would favor the, the second one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, that's yeah. great feedback. Thank you, Arlene. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. <laughs> I see, let's see, I see another hand that. Hi. Lisa? Yeah, hi. I, I'm sorry if I missed this. Is there the decision making on this? Is this is this a democratic process? Are we gonna like be some, like will something get sent out and we'll vote or is it somebody else deciding? Or I guess I'm sorry, I missed that part. No, not at all. That's a good clarifying question. And actually, um Jill and Steven, um, I'm happy to share my point of view, but might defer to you all a little bit on how it feels best to move forward. Um often we can do a couple of things. Often um couple of ways we go about this are, you know, kind of feedback and thoughts today. Um, 
based on the feedback, we can narrow our set of options, assuming that there's some clear direction and alignment initially, which I think we find there often is. So curious to hear from others too and see if we can get there. Um, from there, we can share back some narrowed options and we can do like a, use a Google sheet or something for polling, voting, something like that. We can also go to a smaller core team and group of folks um, if there's um, alignment that a smaller group are serving as core decision makers. Um, so Stephen and Jill, to, um, defer to you, um, but those are a couple of ways we've done it in the past. Uh, well, so far, Maya, we've been uh, uh, coordinating the work through the steering committee. Um, I, I don't think we've made any final decisions in that way, but we have been narrowing options and providing guidance to Emily and Sakara. So uh, I think that would be the primary vehicle for moving forward. Um, if, if task force members want to have a direct uh, decision-making say in that, I'm sure we can work that out. I, I, if we haven't really gotten to that point, and I'm not completely sure whether that's the best use of task force members' time, but if people feel strongly about that, I don't, I don't sense any opposition to that particularly. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Perry, I see your hand. Thanks, Emily. Perry Mowry. Um, I am a response system division supervisor and uh, actually am the chair for the subcommittee for the Crisis Stabilization Center. Um, so I am with, I think, with Arlene uh, that I really like option one IPRTF mm -hmm. uh, in the Woodmark horizontal. Mm -hmm. That just speaks to me. Um, and I also liked option one, um, number three for the Ann Deacon Center for Hope. Um, mm -hmm. I liked the, um, just the layout and, uh, and so forth. So wanted to, um, you know, to speak to that. Um, yeah, number three, I like, mm -hmm. I like the sunburst, um, you know, and that particular component. And Stephen, forgive me if we've already been here, but I did want to bring up that um, just uh, I've been obviously operational in regards to the Crisis Stabilization Center and the concern that I have for um, communication to the community relative to Ann Deacon Center for Hope not actually defining what it is. Um, and so we had discussed, you know, the possibility of a subtext crisis stabilization center, I, you know, maybe this isn't true. Um, I'm not forecasting terribly well, but, you know, simply shifting over and saying, yeah, the end Beacon Center for Hope, and I'm going to assume that individuals in the meeting or wherever we happen to be know what I'm talking about, um, you know, relative to that. So I, I just wanted to make sure and put that in. Um, I'm more pragmatic. Um, in my thought process and certainly have no experience whatsoever in marketing. Um, so, uh, but I do offer that up because I think that that could create some confusion and I'd like somewhere to, you know, discuss that piece and, and whatnot. Thanks. Uh, Perry, yeah. that, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Perry, that was, that was why my hand was up also. Um, mm -hmm. I, Emily and Sakari, you know that that's uh, an ongoing conversation. So, I'm just wondering about the possibility, at least as an option, to have a little subscript uh, under this that says Andy Deacon Center for Hope, a, a crisis stabilization center, or, or something like that, that does does have a, a, a functional and clarifying uh, descriptor to it. Right, right. So Ann Deacon Center for Hope, crisis stabilization center, taking out a... Whatever, whatever your team wants to put forward. Okay. Do you want to, Stephen, do you want to use it for every uh, every item that's put out or for certain items? Well, I think we're looking for uh, um, uh, our, our basic uh, branding. Um, so I, I would think it would be everything. <laughs> And, I, and, and just to fill in the task force, Perry's concern, which I happen to share, is that often over time, uh, the names that are given uh, to things are, are reduced to a, a shorthand kind of 
colloquial use. And, and it, it seems as likely to many of us that whatever we name the, the building and the, and the programs, it, it will come to be known in the community as, as the Crisis Stabilization Center. Uh, it, okay. it, it may be the Andean Crisis Stabilization Center, but somehow that functional descriptor will, will be uh, at least a frequent part of the communication or the identification. So including that from the get-go uh, uh, has some logic to it. I think that's a really great point. Um, I, I think that, again, though, we, I, I think that including that language uh, in a potential logo addresses the issue uh, because I see the actual name for the center is the Ann Deacon Center for Hope, a crisis stabilization center serving Whatcom County and the North Sound region. Like to me, that is the full name. That's the whole sentence that you have to get out in the beginning when you're talking about the Ann Deacon Center for Hope. In terms of what the layman what we hope the layman will actually relate to and what the shorthand will become over time is the center for hope. Because even when people are in crisis, they don't like to be languaged that way. And so there are people that there's a huge stigma of just calling a crisis stabilization center, physically going to a crisis stabilization center because it's an admission within themselves that there is a problem that they can't deal with alone. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety, and there's a lot of stigma. And this goes back to that point, Arlene, that we've been talking about the importance of hope. So for people who are in this industry of community and public health and community services, it's a crisis stabilization center, quote unquote. In community for the layperson, what we are hoping to develop through this effort is a non-stigmatized center for hope. Does that make sense? So I think it's a both and. I think it's a, that we need to be able to explain what it is, but over time, what we would assume would happen is for the lay person out there in community is not gonna be saying, oh, it's a crisis stabilization center. That word crisis, that stigma word crisis and going for the, oh yeah, the Ann Deacon Center for Hope. They help people that have substance use disorder issues or are dealing with you know, something else in their life right now. So I think that's what we're hoping for. Certainly community can decide, no, it's a crisis stabilization center. And that's fine. That's perfectly fine. Um, but you know, we'll just see. I don't necessarily think that it will play out that way, but I think that we do absolutely see the importance of at the at the onset saying, and Deacon Center for Hope Crisis Stabilization Center. So that was a long roundabout way of agreeing with you. And and Sakara, thank you. That that clarification is really helpful. I, I guess for today's purposes. I, I just wanted to endorse Perry's point to float mm -hmm. to the surface yep. as an alternative or an elaboration that that subscript and and then you know we'll we'll sort of hash that out as we yeah. go forward. Absolutely. And I and I think that we would definitely agree with that, Stephen. Yeah, that's great. Um, wonderful. Okay. Uh, any thoughts or feedback on any of these options from folks we haven't heard from so far? Hi, Emily. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put my two cents in there, too. Um, this is Jason. Um, Scar, I love that explanation. Uh, by the way, I think that's spot on. And um, to Stephen's point, I'm glad that you all, Perry, yourself, raised that, because I actually didn't even know. Um, so I'm still trying to catch up <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what the Andy Deacon Center for Hope um, is or what it's meant to be. Um, but I agree, stigma goes a long way. And um, that's something that we as a community need to keep breaking down for folks who are needing services um, that will be offered here. Um, but Emily, to your earlier, I love mm -hmm. option three or number three on this slide mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is a beautiful um, logo. Like I just love everything about that. Um, and then 
I wanted to co-sign on what Arlene had already said, and I think Perry. Um, I, I liked all of those options that they highlighted. I think that they're spot on, the font is, is perfect. And I know this because I also just went through, we're rebranding Northwest U Services. So, oh, um, so yeah, so we're going through the same process. And um, so I love that this is some synergy here. So that's all. Fantastic, thank you very much. Thank you. Perry. Um, you know, I meant to mention when we were talking before in terms of the color palette, and I, I'm the worst guy in the world to ask. You, you wouldn't want me painting any of the rooms in your house or anything of that nature. Um, but I will say that one of the things that, you know, that Ms. Deacon, um, in actually working with her, she continued to pursue calming colors. And for me, the, uh, the last color, I, I won't mm. try and even name it, um, Okay. is not and the other colors are calming okay. colors um so i just offer that thought i meant to mention that earlier thanks thank you yeah appreciate that and i wonder actually i'm just going to pull up this other color palette because i there is also always the option of saying you know to me it's sounding like there's a lot of alignment around um our option one logo three here, generally speaking, for the Antique and Center for Hope, but it's also within the possibility, realm of possibility to say, and we really prefer um, the color palette of a different option. Yeah, so I'm wondering, like to me personally, this color palette here, the purples, um, I think are, are warmer, more calming palette option than that then option one entirely that athletic gold color yeah. yeah um any any additional thoughts or feedback we haven't heard okay so if not just to reflect back and test this thinking um I, I feel like we are definitely hearing the most um, alignment and resonance with option one, both for the task force and for the Center for Hope, um, with a strong leaning toward that third logo option. I am hearing that um, we should add Crisis Stabilization Center as a subtext uh, to the Center for Hope logo option. And I'm hearing um, interest in moving away from that kind of athletic gold orange color um, and sticking with warmer or not necessarily warmer, but more cal calming color palette options. Does that all sound right or anything to add or adjust? For a lot of the task force members, um, this may be the first time you're looking at this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, what I understood Emily saying is they're going to take this back to their project team and and develop a, a second iteration of it. So that that allows a little bit of time for task force members to digest this, to have their own reactions clarify. Um, and if you want to email Jill with any other comments, uh, Jill's the sort of the the uh, conduit for communications with Emily and Sakara, and uh, we can get that information to them. Um, so this this isn't your only opportunity to, to weigh in reactions, even if they Absolutely. didn't hit you uh, right away. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. So I know we're at uh, 9.46 here, so I think that covers what we were hoping to move through with you all today. Um, so grateful for the time and everyone's thoughts and feedback as always. Really appreciate spending time with this group. Any other questions or thoughts before we sign off? Emily and Sakara, thank you so much for your work and for your time uh, keeping us uh, abreast of it. Absolutely. Thank you, so much. thank you. Take good care, everyone. Take care, thank you. So the, uh, I'm sorry, Jill, did you come on? Okay. No, did you need me for something? 
No, I just saw your uh, uh, your box light up, so I thought. Uh... No, like Emily, my computer is a little wonky this morning. So. Okay, okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is uh, an update on the uh, County Council's Justice Project Needs Assessment. Um, and Barry, uh, I believe that's your topic, so I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, hey, good morning, everybody. Um, just wanted to give you a little update on the uh, the work that the Stakeholder Advisory Committee is doing, and then uh, I'm really kind of here to introduce um, our, our next speaker, too, as well, who's going to drill down on some of the things that we've found through the work of the uh, of the uh, committee. So I'm uh, looking forward to those details. But anyway, this week is a very busy week for the committee and all the efforts around the Justice Project. Tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Uh, in the council chambers, we will be having a town hall. It's a uh, listening session, information gathering session that we will be uh, taking input from the public. Um, we also have, uh, as you know, we have a uh, communications consultant uh, similar to what we just discussed uh, with the uh, uh, pyramid. We have another group that's helping us do public outreach. So in addition to doing just a town hall, we're also uh, doing a lot of smaller sessions. We're doing uh, out in tribal nations, out in the Spanish speaking community. Uh, we're trying to reach some of the people that uh, are, are a little harder to reach, um, but that it's very important to, to reach those people of color out in the county and uh, to get their voices. So um, that's basically what's going on. We have uh, also a meeting on Thursday is uh, our regular SAC meeting for, no, uh, for the month of November. Uh, we are gonna be meeting in December. We decided to throw an extra meeting on just because of the workload uh, that we have, uh, our, we keep uncovering. So there's just a lot to do, um, but everybody's enthusiastic. And uh, you're gonna be able to see uh, some of the output uh, in our next presenter. I'll uh turn it back over to Stephen. he can do the formal introduction so uh thanks Stephen. okay thank you barry um and and probably everybody's also been seeing part of that community engagement outreach as a as a community survey and uh uh there is a video tour that lieutenant erickson and jack hovenier uh did and all of that is linked on the uh on the a Whatcom Justice Project SAC website uh, web page. Um, so I, I'm I'm pleased to reintroduce Marty Solomon of Crossroads Consulting. Um, Marty, uh, along with her partner Holly O'Neill, have been uh, uh, guiding us through this uh, strategic our, our stakeholder advisory committee uh, work on the Justice Project, and and Marty in particular has been. Uh, formulating and carrying out a lot of uh, different polling exercises that we've done to try to get a handle on, on input into the process. So Marty's gonna review some of that with you and, and Marty, I'll just turn it over to you to start that process. I'm gonna start by trying to share screen here and see how this goes. Can you all see my screen with slides on it? Yes. All right. Okay. Well, um, happy to be here again to, to show you what we've got uh, from these polls that were uh, conducted recently and that many of you participated in. I uh, have this slide up because I, I just wanted to show, tell you something that you probably already know, which is that over half of the IPRTF is serving on the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. And really, the IPRTF has provided a foundation for the SAC's work and much of the expertise upon which it relies. And I just want to start by thanking you all for being there, doing that. And uh, really, I think I'm here today to make sure that those of you who are not also serving on the SAC are informed about the work. So both groups are moving together in tandem as we enter this final phase of producing the needs assessment report. More specifically, I just wanna share back with you the results of the two polls 
that you completed in October and talk about how your input is used. And I um, believe that you should have received the two reports of the results of these polls in your meeting packet. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about that or you know about the specific findings, but I wanna focus more on how, how we can use that data to keep refining the recommendations that will go into the needs assessment report. Okay, so I want to start with the part, um, the vision, values, and goals poll. And we had 37 responses in all. The middle box is just showing the breakout of stack members, 13 of whom are also on the IPRTF. And then there were three additional IPRTF members who are not on the SAC who completed the poll. And in terms of findings, the, um, the poll had four sections. So we have vision, values, systems or services, it's systems and services, and then facilities goals. So um, it, in each of those sections, I just summarized on this slide how, um, what percentages of agreement we got with the statements in each section. And we had a high level of agreement, 83% or over in uh, up to 97% agreement with the statements um, in each of these sections. And so given that, we're gonna right now just set these statements aside until after we receive the public input that Barry was talking about at tomorrow's town hall and that the VITA agency is collecting and then and um, then we'll come back to these statements and incorporate, um, we're, we'll reflect on them again as a group and decide what kinds of changes to the wording may be needed for the final version. I'm gonna shift over now to the poll that is about needs and recommendations. And we had 35 responses to this one and um, you can see the breakout there. Moving on to the, a, a little bit of a summary of the findings. So the poll asked about 18 top priority needs and corresponding recommendations to address those needs. And the results showed anywhere from 69% to 97% agreement with the needs and recommendations that statements that were in there. The question is how to increase the level of agreement on those needs and recommendations that had the lowest ratings. So that's what we're working on now. So what I did is I went through all the comments that people wrote on their surveys, on their polls, as well as notes from all of the SAC meetings at which the needs and recommendations were discussed. And I suggested revisions to the statements that I thought might address people's concerns and or focus in on the topics more directly. And these suggestions were included in the report you received. So first I presented a chart, then the comments, and then suggested revisions in the report. Um, as you go through it. So now since sending that report, which was about a week ago, I've had some conversations with several subject matter experts and have further refined the suggestions even beyond what you saw. And those of you who are on the SAC will have received an updated version of the proposed revisions. That was um, in a chart that that lays out each need, recommendation, and proposed a level of agreement, and then proposed revisions. So we don't have time today for me to go through all of these, um, but we'll, we, that is what we will be doing at the SAC meeting on Thursday morning. And of course, you all are invited and encouraged to attend that meeting. I do want to highlight a few of the propo proposed revisions, and um, I, I really love your feedback on one section if we have time this morning. So 
what I'm showing right now is just, I wanted to use as an example, this is the fourth need and recommendation under community-based behavioral health services. And uh, people had trouble understanding what this was about. And the percentage of agreement was not as high as we would hope. So the suggestion is over here in the right. And that is to delete the original need and recommendation that's in the, the left side there. The, cur the current need and recommendation are on the left. The proposed revisions are on the right. So the um, proposal is to delete the original and to use this, um, this space here to really focus in on competency restoration, which has been a major topic of discussion in the SAC and the Behavioral Health Subcommittee meetings. So the recommendation came out of these discussions and this recommendation that's proposed here. And, um, and it's really already being implemented by the regional work group that Perry and Barry have started. And so we're thinking that continuing this work to with regional partners to try to affect some policy change that will establish more local competency restoration services is a way to, um, to frame this that where we may have more widespread agreement. I'm gonna just move on to the section that I'm hoping you will um, help with here, it just today. Uh, this is a section on post-incarceration community supports. And it's different from most of the other needs and recommendations because it did not come out of the work of the behavioral health gap analysis team, the BEGAT. These were added later and they came through discussions and um, there was a high level of agreement on the first two needs, but not so much on the recommendations. And then the third need um, was not so rated so highly, but the recommendation was. But overall, the impression through comments and conversation is that perhaps these um, post-incarceration community supports are really beyond the scope of the SAC and that there are other communities working, community groups working on these already. And maybe we should take, a, the, take these off the list of high priority needs and recommendations that the, the needs assessment report will present and incorporate this kind of information into the text of the report, highlighting, it, highlighting the importance of housing and transportation when people leave jail and uh, vocational support in the text, but not having them called out as needs and recommendations. So um, I see Scott has a hand up and then I really don't, I, I will have to stop share in order to see anything else, anybody else, Arlene and Scott. So Scott? Yeah, so I had um, a comment. I think I probably said this at the SAC meeting, but I would, I mean, all of the vision and need things that, that were brought up, I, I saw them all as important and hard to go say, you know, this is not a need. I guess I would have appreciated ranking because when you're given seven needs and they're all great, we all rank them high. But, but knowing that there isn't infinite service and infinite cash, I, it would have been maybe beneficial to you know rank one to seven. Um, that way, you know you have the ability to say which ones are more important to you. They're all important. Let's just face it; they're all important. But you have no way of knowing how which is the most important. Now you just know that everybody liked them all. Well, that's great, but. I, it would have been helpful to have it ranked, in my opinion. There's still time. Okay, I, so I, and I, I see about... I've and I've seen on social media somewhere that this survey is out there that people can click on things and and do it from from. I mean, you're trying to advertise out there on social media to get people to do this, and I guess I would have hoped that we could get more useful re results than just while well, everybody thinks we have needs yes well we know that well how, let's rank them somehow uh-huh 
uh, there's not more time to redo the, <laughs> the survey that's for the general public. Yeah. yeah. Well, but thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I there know. Is yeah. A next step, which um, will be to, uh, I have a next step slide, but I'll just, I will just tell you that um, there will be another opportunity once we have revisions, once we've incorporated the public input and another couple of SAC meetings and this and IPRTF meetings, um, we will have another version of these needs and recommendations and we'll do another poll with SAC and IPRTF. So Great. there's, and, and I, I think um, ranking could be a good way to go at that point for sure. It's a little hard for people, I think, when you have 18 things to try to put in an order. It's a lot, but we can break it up a little bit, I think. Yeah. If we if we can break it into sections, maybe that'll work. So thank you for that. All right, thanks. Arlene? Yes. Um, Throughout the years of uh, the Law and Justice Systems Committee meetings, uh, each time someone has come to give us uh, a report on the functioning of their program, um, it seems to me that almost every single one talked about the need, uh, the importance of housing. And that, and they also said, that their uh, service would be not effective if someone did not have housing because of the stress that happens when you cannot have a place to lie your head, whether or not you're gonna go to your um, counseling meetings or your uh, substance abuse meetings or, uh, or see your doctor or whatever. So, they impressed upon us uh, that housing is a major problem. And, but I, what I didn't understand in, in what you just said was what's the reason for removing this issue from this list? What was the reason? Um, I, I, I wanna just take that in two parts. So yeah. yes, housing is, I think we're getting loud and clear, the same message that you just conveyed. But we have a section in the um, in the rest of the needs and recs, there's a section on housing services for at-risk populations that had three needs and recommendations as well. And th those were much more focused on the population that is, um, at risk of incarceration or or coming out of the in reentry phase, and um, so that's and people with behavioral health issues at the same time. So it was more targeted to a specific at risk population than this general kinds of post incarceration community support statements were. So the reason. Going back to your question, the reason um, that I was suggesting deleting them was that they're very general and not specifically focused um, at, on the target population as much as these other housing recommendations are. And just um, just so you know, those are those housing recommendations are about permanent supportive housing with on-site clinical support and intensive case management. That's, um, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and, and uh, I see the point. And as long as somehow or other, the general public gets the message of the significance of uh, effectiveness of everything else along with housing, that's all. Okay, okay, that's, that's good. So really highlight how's the significance of housing. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Um, Okay, I just want to let you know, uh, or I'll switch over here to the slides again. And I think I'm probably about out of time. So I just will tell you that 
Um, we have um, a new section that is added that we'd like to propose. This is a first draft of a section of needs and recommendations that are focusing on facilities. And this is something that we'll share with the at the SAC meeting on Thursday. I just wanted you to know that we're trying to get this in there. And Raylene, I see, I see your hand. I'm sorry. I can't see everybody while the slide's on, but I see you. Would you like to? No worries. I, I'm happy to wait. I just wanted to mention that I concurred with uh, Mayor Courtheis on having a ranking system. I think that would be beneficial. But on an earlier slide, you said that because not everybody agreed the thought was to maybe remove um, the slide with the response time for law enforcement on the ITA um, and then replace it with restoration and competency, which is something that's currently being worked on. I think both of them are important. I would um, hope that maybe we could leave both of them in there and have a ranking system rather than removing them, because I think they're two separate issues, even though they can um, correlate with each other. Thank you. That's great. Thank, thanks, Raylene. I, um, do you think you would be a person to help work on the language for those to, to try to make, try to make the one about law enforcement and ITAs more understandable to those who aren't in the field and kind of, um, yeah, get that. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I'd be happy to take a jab at it, um, but I can't promise you it's going to be exactly what you want. But I do think they're separate. I think, you know, law enforcement still need to respond to stuff because people don't always reach out. But the competency and restoration, like I said, I think they're completely separate. Um, they do correlate sometimes after law enforcement has been involved and they're maybe in custody for it, but they're they're both important. So um, I'll look at it and see what I can figure out. Thanks. Thank you. I'll be in touch about that. And Perry. Marty, thanks. Yeah, uh, really makes a good point. Um, a couple of things just to be aware of. Um, the Law enforcement has a direct line, a direct phone number to our mobile crisis outreach team, which are our designated crisis responders. Instead of going through, uh, typically, if you called 911, you know, and et cetera, you go through Volunteers of America and they then connect to the mobile crisis outreach team and et cetera. So they do have a direct line to uh, Compass Health, um, a mobile crisis outreach team. And since the begat was doing the work and coming up with the developments and so forth, one of the concerns that I had around that was there was actually no discussion with MCOT, with the actual providers that uh, uh, are involved, obviously, with our designated crisis responders, um, you know, in regard to um, that particular component. And secondly, I think that folks are aware that we are imminent in our implementation of our co-responder program with the Washington, uh, Washington County Sheriff's Office, which will have a mental health professional riding along with the behavioral health deputies and will have a direct connection. That mental health uh, professional will have a direct connection to MCOT as well, if that level you know, is needed and et cetera. So uh, just wanted to add some additional information to that discussion um, around resources that have changed just a little bit and that communication, that line of communication. That was my hope. Thanks, Perry. Okay, so we'll have to figure out how much to... Uh, so it sounds like we still have some work to do on this one for sure. Um, okay. Uh, so I just wanted to tell you that we have um, facilities Recommend, needs and recommendations in process, and then um, show you the next steps. So Barry mentioned town hall and gathering of public input. Uh, hope that you can come to the town hall tomorrow. And then we'll revise the statements again as needed based on that public input. And um, 
and be discussing these needs and recommendations at meetings of the SAC and the IPRTF, your next meeting at December 19th. And then we will incorporate them into the final needs assessment and be sharing that out at the, at the January SAC meeting, there will be kind of voting to approve that needs assessment and also um, the IPRTF serving as the Law and Justice Council will vote about approval of the needs assessment at the January meeting. So that's what we have coming up. Thank you so much for allowing me to share that here today and for your thoughts. Thank you very much, Marty, for all the work that went into that and, and that lies ahead. Um, Task Force members, any final comments that Marty can take back inside the, the SAC discussions coming up? Okay, thanks, Marty. Bye-bye. Right. Uh, so the next item on the agenda are the committee updates. Uh, and as usual, we'll start with the steering committee. Barry, that puts you back on. Stephen, uh, if you remember right, I was not able to attend. Uh, I had forgotten that. Um, and I don't have any uh, recollection of the meeting myself. Um, so I, I think uh, there are summary notes available and I'll uh, refer people to those uh, for the, uh, the content of the last uh, November uh, steering committee meeting. Um, and Perry, anything to report on the Crisis Stabilization Center uh, Committee? Sure. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Perry Mowry, Response Systems Division uh, Supervisor, as well as the Chair for the Crisis Stabilization Center uh, Subcommittee. Um, I, uh, we met uh, on the 20th of October. Um, and uh, predominantly talked about three, really three components, uh, crisis stabilization center referrals and utilization for the first uh, three quarters of 2022. Um, we also touched on uh, a project that has been ongoing and I think very important, um, the streamlining uh, admission process for uh, law enforcement and first responders. Um, and uh, we actually had completed in our uh, recent, uh, we have a crisis stabilization center advisory committee and within the advisory committee, we uh, finalized the steps for streamlining admission processes for law enforcement um, and first responders. The intent of that being that they have a very quick phone call um, that is made to the crisis stabilization center to essentially give some basic information and ensure that there is a bed available. Uh, then transport by the first responder law enforcement um, occurs and a very quick drop off. Um, so we've arrived at a place of where both providers are uh, lined up with uh, this uh, um, um, quick uh, uh, process for uh, law enforcement and first responders and happy about that piece. We'll continue to get feedback on that. And then lastly, we talked about, um, if folks will recall, there is a process going on of implementation of 12 hour uh, law enforcement holds. This is related to RCW 1031-110. There was a number of steps that needed to occur and they were fairly um, significant uh, for them to occur. One was for Compass Health. This is specific to mental health stabilization um, at the facility uh, and Compass Health did uh, complete their uh, certification um, for what is technically an involuntary hold. Um, so there's some additional requirements that occur uh, uh, relative to that in terms of staffing, in terms of protocol and procedure, but they did receive that certification from Department of Health um, to move forward with that. Uh, Compass Health also uh, uh, posted and filled vacancies fairly recently because they did have to increase their staffing model in order to implement um, the uh, 12 hour law enforcement holds and the targeted implementation for that is 
prior to January 2023. There's some training and some steps that need to occur. Um, and during that time, we've done some communication with law enforcement, um, uh, since this is specific to law enforcement. So we've done some communication up to this point in time, but I'll be um, including a how to a quick reference of how to for 12 hour law enforcement holds and then communicating with our law enforcement um, stakeholders in that regard. And that was, uh, in essence, a short version of um, what occurred during the meeting. Thank you, Perry. Any questions for Perry on Crisis Stabilization Center development? Nice to hear that law enforcement hold capability is, is on, on the edge of implementation. Um, Behavioral Health Committee, uh, neither co-chair Dan or Mike are here. Uh, it's been a little while since they met themselves. I think there was a joint meeting in November. So Raylene and, and Arlene, uh, are you prepared to talk about legal and justice systems subcommittee? And I think that would include uh, the joint meeting. Well, I think we had our meeting on November 8th, which was the Legal and Justice Committee. It wasn't a joint meeting. We did discuss um, upcoming topics for the joint meeting. So um, we, we did discuss that it would be good to have um, uh, the competency, competency and restoration um, work that's being done with um, Barry and Perry. If we can get an update maybe at the next joint meeting, which I believe is in December. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Jill. Um, on the other stuff we was discussing were re-entry. Um, Jackie Mitchell gave us um, some information on the clinical aspects of re-entry and what her and Melora are working on. Most of the re-entry that they are working on is the behavioral health side. Um, but there was still this need for more staffing counselors, um, need for correction staff, need for individuals maybe not specialized in the behavioral health or corrections, but just to assist on um, making sure that those connections are made when somebody is released from custody. Um, there was a lot of talk on bringing information in from Maya brought in Department of Corrections and an individual that she was meeting with that might be available to speak on what um, DOC is doing as well as Chief Tanksley brought up. Um, that he wanted to see if they had any programs that are currently working. The other um, issue that was mentioned was the space um, needed. There isn't any space in the current facility that's adequate for the needs of assisting people with reentry. And is there something that we can use um, in the meantime? So that's an ongoing topic that will be, um, I'm sure, brought into 2023. Um, and we discussed briefly of what other services we'd like to address um, next year. So I think that's about it. Arlene, am I missing anything? No, that's that's it. Perfect. Any questions? Excellent. Thank you, Raylene. Appreciate that. Um, so we're on to other business, if there is any. Uh, and so I'd entertain uh, questions or subjects uh, any task force members want to propose. And I see none. So Jill, we're at public comment. Would you request that, please? Yes, thank you. It doesn't look like there are any attendees in person in the council conference room. We have a number of online attendees. If any of you would like to speak to the task force, uh, please virtually raise your hand now. And no hands are raised. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending, uh, working through uh, some important subjects that we have uh, in process. Uh, remind everybody, encourage everybody about the, the SAC Town Hall listening session tomorrow evening and uh, joining the SAC meeting on Thursday morning. Um, and uh, with that, we'll adjourn the task force meeting.